Welcome back, listeners, to Sandman Stories Presents, a folklore podcast where I read you to sleep or until the next story. I'm your host, Dustin. This is story number four in the Ecuadorian ghost stories for our Halloween series. I'm sure I'll read many more of these stories upcoming throughout the channel. I'll keep doing them because they're awesome. But this one is about Vico, who we met earlier, and Vico has a deal with the devil. Vico is kind of a, a guy who the devil is always following. He never seems to do stuff right. You know, he's not listening to his grandma, all that sort of stuff. So this one is called Vico's Deal with the Devil. Vico Pacta con el Diablo. And this is from the Huambalo region near Pelelio. Okay, let's begin. Vico's Deal with the Devil in the town of Huambalo, not far from Pelelio, lived an insolent young man who, as a boy, had on one occasion barely escaped the clutches of a demonic imp who inhabited a nearby ravine. This young man's name was Vico. Ever since he was a boy, he had been very mischievous, a miscreant fond of the streets and of street games. When he got older, he exchanged mischief for vices, such as smoking, drinking, and gambling. On Saturday nights, he would go out to the cantinas and get drunk to the point of shamelessness. And while staggering home early in the morning, he would shout insults at every house he passed. The night before the celebration of the Virgin of the Mountain, Vico went with some friends to the festivities in the town of El Pingue, which were very popular in those days. It used to take about an hour on horseback to get to El Pingue from Huambalo, following an old dirt trail. Well past midnight at the dance, Vico noticed a young woman who stood out from the crowd with her elegant white scarf and her hair done up in a bun. She was accompanied by her fiancé, a strapping young man from the village. But this was no obstacle for Vico, who was so drunk he began openly to make advances towards the girl. The young woman's fiancé soon got angry with the deceitful lout's excessive overtures and they came to blows. Vico's friends from Huambalo managed to prevent the fight from becoming more serious, and they took their companion and decided to head home. They had just gotten on their horses when Vico suddenly spurred his horse and raced ahead of the others. His plan was to lose his friends and come back around to settle the score with the girl's fiancé. After he rode around the village, tied his horse to some bushes and returned to the dance. As soon as he got to the square, he assaulted his rival, but the fiancé was a solid fellow and also sober, and so the fight was two punches long. Bleeding, with one eye swollen shut and still reeling from the booze, Vico decided to return to Huambalo. Unfortunately for him, he was so drunk and confused that he could not remember where he'd left his horse. The sun would soon rise, and his head was still spinning. Guided by instinct, he began to walk home. He staggered like a sleepwalker for more than an hour. At about five in the morning, he saw the shadows of Bolivar Hill, which rises above Humbalo as a hidden monster in the middle of dawn. Vico was happy to see this sign that he was returning to familiar territory, and he began to sober up. No one dared to challenge him here. In order to avoid the ravine at Hualag Chaco, where the imp had appeared to him when he was a boy, he took a Chacuinan or detour through the village of La Florida. From there, he could cross the town and go directly to his house. He was about to enter La Florida when he noticed a man wearing a black suit standing in the middle of the path. The man appeared to be waiting for someone because he was not moving. He was tall and slim, with a delicate mustache and a forked goatee. He wore a felt hat like the ones favored by people from the city. In spite of the fact that dawn was breaking and the light was still somewhat dim, Vico noticed the man's large hands and long bony fingers. The man was staring directly at him. He was a stranger, mysterious, but Vico nevertheless found something familiar about his face, as if he had seen the man before. What are you looking at? Vico asked, annoyed that the man would not look away keeping his shudderingly penetrating gaze fixed on Vico. You need my help. 
Vika was surprised at the man's familiar tone of voice, as if they were old friends. Vico thought that only he could treat strangers in such an offhand way. Do you know who I am? The drunken young man asked. Damn, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't dare take that tone with me. I can help you get the girl with the bun in her hair and all the other women in the world, or the world itself if you want. I see the gossip got here ahead of me. Let me accompany you on your path. We can talk on the way. The strange man offered. The young drunk was about to answer with a barrage of insults, but something inside him made him keep his quiet, and he began walking beside him. They began to walk towards La Florida. It was still dark. They crossed the sleeping little town without stopping. When they left the town, however, the stranger turned down another path, as he wished to avoid the road to Huambalo. Why the hell are we walking in circles? Vico asked, annoyed. There's a cross over that way. It's not good to disturb the souls that rest on the roads. They continued walking, but instead of going directly to Huambalo, the stranger made a half turn and went back the way they had come. They arrived at a little store, set away from La Florida, and not far from the ravine at Gualagchaco. The stranger said that he felt like a drink. I'll get us a bottle, he offered. Okay, I'll wait here, the young drunk replied readily. In spite of the fact that the store's doors remained closed and the lights never went on, the stranger quickly returned with a bottle and some cigarettes. Vico opened the bottle hastily and without question. Mellowing as he drank, only after several gulps did Vico realize that they were walking towards the ravine. Hey, where are we going? Vico slurred, his voice nearly unintelligible. Like I told you before, I'll accompany you on your path. You're a strange one, the drunken young man said. You avoid crosses, you enter closed stores, and there's something about you that seems so familiar. That's because we've met before. Only, when I appeared to you that time, I was smaller and I was wearing a large hat and a red poncho. Do you remember? A sudden panic took hold of Vico when he remembered the imp that had almost caught him when he was a child, and he began to tremble with fear. It was only then that he noticed his companion's bony fingers ended in black fingernails, and with horror saw for the first time something he had overlooked before. Out of the stranger's backside, grew a thick, fleshy tail that coiled up between his legs. Vico went pale when he realized he was face to face with the devil. As if in a nightmare, the drunken young man tried to defend himself by hurling a litany of insults at the stranger, while the devil, with an evil grin, began to whip him with a switch from the bambrio tree, attempting to drive him to the bottom of the ravine. Insane with terror, his clothes shredded by the whipping, Vico dropped to his knees to beg for mercy, promising to serve the devil for the rest of his life. When he heard Vico's promise, the demon stopped whipping him. Everything was still fuzzy. Vico was barely aware of where he was and didn't know if what was happening was real or a drunken hallucination. He saw the devil take out a single gold coin and offer it to him. The devil's words were forever etched into his memory from that day forward. With this coin, he could buy riches, women, and anything else he wished. In exchange, on the day of his death, the devil would take his body and soul. Vico tried to resist the temptation, but in a moment of weakness, as if compelled by some supernatural force, he extended his hand. At that moment, Vico collapsed and blacked out. A few hours later, he awoke beside the creek that flowed through the bottom of the ravine. The cold, swirling water was wetting his feet. He only had one boot. His pants were filthy and fetid. His shirt was in tatters. He had lost his jacket. He got up, and his head felt as heavy as a stone. He needed to sleep. He wanted to stretch out on his bed, and so he climbed painfully out of the ravine and began to make his way home. 
When he arrived at his house, his younger brother, who at first was so startled by Vico's appearance that he confused him for a ghost, helped him inside. Vico seemed to be sleepwalking. Without a word, he went to a seat in the living room and sat down stiffly, like a taxidermied animal, staring ahead with bulging eyes. Although he appeared to be asleep, he had one hand clenched in a fist, as if holding something valuable. It was the gold coin. The end. Vico. I, I had such high hopes for you. I, I thought, you know, maybe Grandma would get you out of it. And then when he was by the ravine, I, I thought he was going to get down on his knees and pledge his life to the Lord and get out of it. But no, he, he went the other way. He went with the red man. And thank you all for sticking with me through all this. I know I've butchered some of the Quechua words or some of the Spanish words. I'm trying my best, but if you have a better pronunciation, I'm always open. And this was the final story in our Ecuadorian Ghost Stories series. I will be reading the rest of the book. I'll be putting out episodes regularly with all my other episodes. And I just wanted to give one more big shout out to Mario Conde. Thank you so much for letting me read your stories. I know these stories belong to the Ecuadorian people, but it's such a blessing to, to have these stories and share them with the world. So thank you so much. And thank you to the people of Ecuador for writing down these stories, for telling these stories. I'm just very, very thankful. Thank you. Happy Halloween. And good night.